Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, scholars. We humbly apologize. You know, the fourth industrial revolution, so we just have to adjust. <laughs> but um, this is a, actually one of the most important public lectures I can think of beginning of the year. And uh, first, I would like to just double check our diversity. Dumelang? Bonjour. Murubangi. Bawani. Okay. Uh, who, 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 no, it's, it's absolutely okay. But that's the point. You know, language also brings us together, and I think it's one of the values of the Institute for Pan African uh, Thought and Conversation. Um, I'm going to also ask our online delegates or guests just to all view and just to all mute their mics. As I indicated, um, today is a very special day for uh, the University of Johannesburg as the Institute for Pan-African Thought and Conversation is hosting a public lecturer um, that is focused on unlearning the lessons of coloniality, exhuming subjected knowledges and marginalized epistemies in the quest for social transformation. And colleagues, our students, and all our respective academics, uh, we say protocol observed. Um, and I don't want to waste any time, so I'm going to call our very own Professor Sipamandla Zondi to give us an opening remark. May we please give him a round of applause. Uh, good afternoon, and, 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 and thanks to the program director. Um, I'm not supposed to be on this podium, uh, I was uh, given this role uh, for window dressing. <laughs> Otherwise, there would have been no men in the program today. <laughs> so I represent that other gender. But thank you very much. We are the Institute for Pan-African Thought and Conversation. We are very pleased to have this conversation about a very important uh, subject, not just for us here, but for the continent, for global Africa, and I think for a better world. And we couldn't have a better person to take us through this subject than our dear friend, our dear sister, uh, who is shy like me, introverted like me, uh, Professor Yeumi, uh, to take us through this conversation. The Institute for Pan-African Thought is, con is mandated and committed uh, to pursue Pan-African thought and, and Pan-African conversation. The Institute does that in, uh, in six areas, roughly. The first one is African Union Studies, which is a unit within the Institute. The second one is uh, the local, looking at local issues, the local space on the African continent. And the third one is public health and well-being. Um, need to emphasize the last part, public health and well-being uh, on the African continent. Uh, the next one is Digital Africa or DG Africa, uh, which is about digital technologies and how they could transform Africa. Uh, the next one is the Pan African Thought or Rethinking Africa um, unit. And the last one is the one that is hosting us today, which is the Pan African Women Studies. And we welcome all of you to continue to support us and <coughs> advise us and Tell us how we could do this work and do it better. All of you feel welcome. Uh, I, I want to say, particularly my first year, I see members of the first year course, Introduction to Political Science. I see some of them here, my, my first years. Those are my precious ones. They give me a lot of trouble and they deserve to be here. Thank you very much and feel welcome. 
Thank you so much, Prof. Um, we really celebrate the Institute. And I think, like we always say, the Institute is a reflection of the UJ values. This is truly a moment where we are having conversation, we're reimagining, we're regenerating, and obviously we're providing an ethical foundation for everyone that has joined us today. I also would like to call uh, Dr. Tinwa De Ojo, uh, who will also introduce Professor Oye Oyeronke Oyewumi. Please let's give Prof, uh, Dr. Ojo sorry, a round of applause. everyone and you're welcome to this public lecture. Um, many institutions, policies, um, research, studies, educational disciplines and even laws have actually accused of lacking a gender lens and this has actually placed women among other genders at a disadvantage. So many groups have organized themselves and fought against injustice from time immemorial and feminist movements are actually amongst them. I'm not preaching. <laughs> the golden thread within the movement, you know, have been to fight against gender inequality and improve living conditions such that women, women's rights are actually respected. So African women are still seen to be playing a second fiddle um, in all spheres of society. They joined forces in anti-colonial freedom movement, and they have been part of the labor movement, and they have been part of wars in different eras. So African feminism has emerged through live experiences as school of church and platforms for organizing women who want to challenge the patriarchal and colonial order. These streams have emerged due to the Western feminism movement being perceived as a gender blind because they lacked and sidelined African women. So there are still contentions um, within the academy and general discourse surrounding African feminism, which is one of the things that brought us here. And um, one of the <coughs> biggest challenge has been the notion that feminism is un-African. But what remains true is the sentiment that the plight of women is a human rights issue that must be taken seriously. And in efforts to decolonize sisterhood, womanhood, and even nationhood, many scholars have sought to develop African conceptions of the former. These lessons and many more are going, we are going to be learned um, by Professor Oyewumi today. Dear colleagues, on behalf of Pan-African Women's Studies Unit and the entire staff of the Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation and the Institute of Global African Affairs, it gives me a pleasure to introduce Professor Hoyewumi, Oyeronke Hoyewumi, a Letsima visiting professor. Professor Oyeronke Hoyewumi is a Nigerian gender scholar and full professor of sociology at Stony Brook University. She acquired a bachelor's degree at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria and pursued a graduate degree in sociology at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Oyewumi was named the 2021 Distinguished Africanist Award. Award winner by the African Studies Association, which recognizes and honors individuals who have contributed a lifetime of outstanding scholarship in African studies compared with service to the Africanist community. Professor Hoyewumi's interdisciplinary work highlights an African perspective that is largely underrepresented in academia. I'm sure you agree with that. Mm. So much of our academic research and writing draws on African experiences to illuminate theoretical questions in a variety of disciplines, including sociology, political science, women's studies, religion, history, and literature, all with the goal of broadening scholarly understanding to include non-Western cultures. In our 1997 monograph, 
the invention of women. I'm sure everybody has seen that. Making an African sense of Western gender discourses. She offers a post-colonial feminist critic of the Western dominance in African studies. In the book, she explained that despite vast amount of academic research claiming otherwise, the stratification of gender in the Yoruba culture is entirely a colonial legacy. And in 1998, the book received the American Sociology Association Distinguished Book Award in the gender and sex category. With Jill Hannah, I would like us to give a distinguished applause as we welcome our Lesima visiting professor, the legendary herself, Professor Oye Rose. Feel like singing now. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, thank you for that wonderful introduction, and thank you everyone for showing up, and those online too. I'm really appreciated that I have an audience. <laughs> That's never guaranteed, <laughs> professors. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. Let me start with two disclaimers. <laughs> the title of my lecture. If you looked at it, you can see that it's very capacious. <laughs> there are a lot of things you can put into that lecture, right? Because my work is about epistemology, however I name it, right? So I called it on learning the lessons of coloniality. <laughs> I've given lectures about that before. I have also given many lectures on decolonizing knowledge. So I feel that all those things come together in this lecture, just depending on the, on the focus, OK? That's my first disclaimer about <laughs> the fluidity <laughs> of the title. Yeah. The second disclaimer, and this just came to me. I had to laugh this afternoon. Because a whole lot of what I'm going to be talking about, especially the historical part, shows that I am a West African. <laughs> when I'm looking at history, right? Or maybe even an East African. So I wrote at the very beginning of this, less people <laughs> think I don't know about this. I wrote, I know that Van Riebeck arrived at the Cape in 1652, yes, not 1884. <laughs> I know that. Maybe we can come to that later. But let me proceed. OK? Yeah. <laughs> so in 2018, the National Geographic faced its own racial reckoning, acknowledging its past racist coverage of African Africans. It recognized its seminal role in propounding and promoting what Chimamanda Adichie calls the single story of Africa. Single story of Africa as a place of negation, as a place of lack, as a place of degradation, as a place of primitivism. The best newspaper headline for this momentous admission of the National Geographic was National Geographic apologizes for 500 years of fake news about Africa. Mm. Unfortunately, there was no such headline except on my Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> and Sifamandla probably saw it. Yes. Okay? So fake news is the name of much of the so-called knowledge that Western countries have self-servingly created to subordinate and deny any humanity to those whom they dominate. As Brian Stevenson, the African-American social justice activist and law professor points out in the context 
of black enslavement in the United States. The great, and I quote, the greatest evil of American slavery was not involuntary servitude, but rather the narrative of racial differences we created to legitimate slavery. Because we never dealt with that evil. I don't think slavery ended in 1865. It just evolved, end of quote. I start with these epigraphs to underscore the importance of narratives, storytelling, fabulating in the process of creating this unjust and unequal capitalist world in which we find ourselves. Narratives, stories are deployed to justify theft, genocide, subordination, perpetual dominance, we can go. Today, the call to decolonize universities resonates globally. One group of international scholars articulated why we must decolonize thus. And I quote, for far too long, we have lived under the Eurocentric assumption that our local knowledges, our ancient and contemporary scholars, our cultural practices, our indigenous intellectual traditions, our stories, our histories, and our languages are better given up entirely." End of quote. What this all speaks to is the white supremacy that have come to define the modern world. Nowhere is it more poignant than in the constitution and production of knowledge. Eurocentric epistemologies were foundational to the subjugation of conquered peoples and their continuing domination. Since the inauguration of the modern colonial system, Latino decolonial sociologist Ramon Grossfogel reminds us that genocides in the Americas or anywhere really are accompanied by epistemicides, which is death of knowledge, death of different forms of knowledge, De death of ways of knowing, and of course, need I say, death of knowers. Mm -hmm. How did this state of affairs come to be? What are the origins of the current unequal global system? And most importantly, and I think that's the most important thing we must all think about, how do we change it? Or what are the practices that we're already doing that are changing things? We must not forget that. So this afternoon, I will discuss my work around the issues of knowledge and learning. My focus is on the production of knowledge, its subjugation, its suppression. Okay, there we are. It's actually a friend of from the US. She's yeah, she's on a sabbatical. She's giving a lecture, DJ. <laughs> important one to have. Finally, in the third part of the lecture, I discuss my work and see how it illuminates and intersects with the debate 
about decolonizing, colonization, the colonial impact, and all those things. I look at how gender is implicated in, in, in knowledge making and as a great example of the universalization of Eurocentric epistemologies. I dwell on my finding that gender is a colonial character. That gender is a colonial category in the context of Yoruba societies. What does it say about how we move forward? Where does my work fall? I conclude with the question of decolonizing. To what effect? What is the goal? So let me go to the first part of my lecture, which is about coloniality of power. The global hierarchies we inhabit are the legacy of a process that started over five centuries ago, which Peruvian sociologist Anibal Quijano calls the coloniality of power, a process that is constitutive of modernity. He discusses the inauguration through settler colonialism of a global system that heralded a new model of power. It was a Euro-centered capitalism in which the fundamental axis of the model of power is, and I quote, the social classification of the world's population around the idea of race, end of quote. A mental construct that was naturalized and claimed an innate racial superiority as the explanation for European dominance of other groups. The racial narrative Theories displayed earlier forms of dominance, which had been understood to be based on brutal force. Let me quote Anibal Kiano at some length. I think this is a, a, an important um, claim that he makes. And I quote, in constituting this social classification, Coloniality permeates all aspects of social existence and gives rise to new social geocultural identities. Europeans, Africans, Black, White, Indians. Europe was mythologically understood to predate this pattern of power as a world capitalist center that colonized the rest of the world. And as such, the most advanced moment in the linear unidirectional continuous path of the species. <laughs> the theme of the narrative that is used to explain the modern world, the theme of narrative that accompanied Euro-American domination is often <laughs> re referred to as the rise of the West narrative that seeks to justify the unequal and on just global world we live in. Enrique Dussel, another um, decolonial scholar, writes about this as the myth of modernity. That is the myth that Europe all by itself internally generated modernity. And what, and what Europe sought to do around the world, whether when they went to the Americas, and they conquered the Aztecs, the Incas, various African groups and all that, that what they were trying to do was to distribute the fruits of modernity which they had in abundance in Europe. And some of those fruits are things like democracy and freedom. And then you often hear them talk about European conquest of the Americas as expansion something very benign. I always think of when you bake bread and it just expands <laughs> nicely, okay? Parallel to this rise of the West narrative is what I term the degradation of Africa narrative, which de depicts Africa as Europe's order, other, and Africa represents what Europe is not. That's why the fact that this elaboration of the coloniality of power was in the crucible of modernity, the Americas, 
my interest in the coloniality of power, that concept, as an African scholar, is to highlight the importance of what, what went on in the Americas to the fate and well-being of Africans on the continent. All too often, the modern history of Africans and the history of modernity is recounted as if it started in 1884 at the Berlin Conference and the colonial occupation of the continent that followed. I engage with the concept of coloniality of power in an attempt to give historical depth to Africa's multi-layered experience of colonial domination and its consequences. It should be understood that by the time Europe re-emerged on the African shores in the 19th century, I'm very conscious that this is a South African audience and that doesn't quite work for South Africa, but on the continent in general, 1884 is such an important date. So I'm saying that by the time Europe re-emerged, re right? there had been the period of the Atlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. And by 1884, they showed up on the shores of Africa. I am arguing that by that time, Europeans had become white people. Mm -hmm. They didn't start out as white. Mm -hmm. Columbus wasn't white. They weren't even Europeans. You can get to that. But the whole point of this was that by the time they showed up, they had become white because they had already benefited from the largesse that African enslavement enabled and the conquest of the Americas enabled. Most importantly, by the 19th century, Europeans understood themselves to be a different species of humans than the rest. But their self-perception was also different from what it had been a few centuries earlier. For one thing, they were not Europeans, they were not white. There was no such category, which is what Anibal Kiano said about new, new categories developed as a result of the conquest. And some of those new categories were Europeans, Africans, Black, Indians. If those categories, words existed before then, the meaning shifted. So for one thing, they were not Euro European or white. Even category Europe before then was a geographical term in the 15th century. But by the 19th century, they were transformed and unified by the experiences of African enslavement. That is colonization of African labor. Conquest of the Americas, colonization of both land and labor. <clears throat> and the racial gender system of modernity that they put in place. One of my favorite lines from uh, a famous historian, Eric Williams, uh, historian of, of, of capitalism and slavery. He said, Negroes were stolen from Africa to work the land stolen from the Indians in America. Oh. So they had become Europeans and Eurocentric, which among other things is an epistemological idea. The European of the, the Berlin Conference was already post-colonial. This is me now asking us, I'm inviting us to look at that concept of post-colonial beyond the colonized. Why can't we apply it to the colonizer? So I am arguing that by 1884, when these Europeans met, at the Berlin Conference to divide up Africa, they were already post-colonial. And how did I arrive at, at that? After many years of teaching these things in my classroom, one day one of the things that struck me was their unity at the Berlin Conference. Why were they so unified? 
if you follow their history, they went to unified. We know about the Spanish-American War, how Louisiana was part. When you follow the history in the Americas, you have to stop in the tracks. That so by 1884, what had happened so that their unity was part of the benefit, right? That they received from the exploitation of land, labor, gold, tea. They had come together, started to recognize themselves as superior. <clears throat> and so I'm inviting us to also expand the concept of post-colonial as a benefit that came to this group of people. So by that time, the myth of modernity was firmly in place. And they created a new narrative. I think that's important because knowledge is about storytelling. And I can't overemphasize that. Narratives, because I'm also asking us, we need to create new narratives, our own narratives, right? <clears throat> they had created new narratives about European identity. They had created a new narrative about their past by creating new pasts. <clears throat> For one thing, one of the, the things that we're, we're really aware of and people have done work on it is the way in which they, they recreated the, the, the history of Greek civilization and then attached that civilization to Europe and that the Greeks are the forebears of Europe. <clears throat> but what is funny is that historically, it was Ar the Arabs, it was Arab sources that saved <laughs> all the knowledge of the Greeks and exposed Europeans to it. So, but they created a new narrative about themselves. And if you are aware of the work of um, Black Athena, about the origins of Greece. <clears throat> These are some of the issues. <clears throat> Consequently, the idea of late colonialism, thank you, Consequently, the idea of late colonialism associated with the 19th century century colonial occupation of the African continent, which is often seen as late in relation to the colonization of the Americas, South Asia, and East Asia. I believe it's a misnomer. It gives the impression that the global process of colonization are several processes, and most significantly suggest Africa's isolation from global capitalism to which she had dearly contributed from the very beginning. So I'm suggesting that Africa was very much part of the colonial system from its inception. And if one believes that, I think that what it does is also to understand um, colonization as a different kind of process because we tend to think of colonialism, who oh, Africa was colonized in 1884, India maybe 150 years earlier, but it was this one, it was one colonial system with different iterations because we're talking about global capitalism, okay? So the, the idea of late colonialism just erases the period of the Atlantic slave trade and the, the, the contributions of Africa to the foundations of the capitalist system. And so I don't believe in a late colonialism. We can talk about stages, we can talk about different phases of the incorporation of Africa into the global capitalist system. Initially, 
it was the colonization of African labor, millions. And then they came to the continent. And there's no way, no way we can separate the period of the Atlantic slave trade from the period of colonization. We can't pretend that they are not related. We can talk about that later. I am also suggesting that the ways in which enslaved Africans were treated in the Americas constituted part of our history on the continent because it produced a fat and greedy Europe that was eager, ready, and resourced to exploit and harvest from a vulnerable African space and degraded African identity. White supremacy is the current context under which we study, we live, and we meet, as we are doing today. But it's under a lot of pressure. It is being challenged, it is being resisted, and we want to transform that state of affairs. We must never forget. In the next section, I talk about the controversy and debate about the colonial impact. This is an old debate in, in, in African studies. The controversy unfolds around the length, the co chronological duration of the colonial period in much of Africa. Some scholars, like the Nigerian historian, J.F. Adiyajai, posited that because the colonial period hardly lasted more than 80 years in most parts of Africa, in South Africa, that's a strange claim, right? Mm. <laughs> it was episodic, right? Mm. It's like you're, you are watching <clears throat> a sitcom <laughs> for 10 years, 20 years. How many episodes per year? You can see thousands. Mm -hmm. And so colonialism was just one episode in the long durée long duration of African history, that colonization was so short, right? So stop crying over it, okay, that's me. <laughs> it is too short, it was just episodic. And precisely, uh, scholars who believe that colonization was episodic, just one episode, if you think of the long durée of African culture and, and history, that you will see that the colonial impact was thin on the ground. It wasn't much, okay? So there are those scholars who said it was episodic. J.F. Adiyajayi stands out. And we can talk about why he was saying that, because you, you, you can't just dismiss him and say, oh, he's an Uncle Tom, or his mind is colonized, you know? Because the other group of people who felt that it was episodic were a lot of, 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 of white historians. It's as if you, you guys are making such a big deal of this. But then when they talk like that, they also want to talk about the colonial impact and say, well, you know, the impact was positive, yes. right? So they have what uh, Walter Rodney, the Guyanese historian out of um, Dar es Salaam, called the balance sheet approach to colonization, which is, from um, his perspective, it's ridiculous. And I agree with him. You can't have a balance sheet approach to colonization. We can talk about that because they want to say, on the one hand, mm. colonization did good things. On the other hand, it did bad things. And one of my favorite quotes from Walter Rodney, who wrote How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, he said that colonization was a one-armed bandit. You can't say on the one hand, it was all bad. It, it's just degradation. Even the idea of thinking about it in those terms already shows that there's a problem. So you have on the other side now, scholars like um, Walter Rodney, who believe that the impact of colonization was epochal, great degradation that it doesn't matter whether it was five years or 80 years. That's if you agree with the chronology. Because if you agreed with my chronology from 1492, the whole idea that it was only 80 years, we can debate it, right? Mm. So people like uh, that, um, Walter Rodney said that it was epochal. 
so episodic and epochal. Those are the, 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 the two sides. But it's, of course, it's not, shouldn't be a binary. But it's an interesting debate. It's an old debate. But there's a, a new iteration of that debate. And this new iteration. work of two scholars on opposite sides of the debate. Perhaps we can bring them to conversation. And the decolonial historian, Pablo Ndlovu Gacheni, who many of you know, is a proponent of many of the claims highlighted earlier in this lecture, because he's a de decolonial scholar and he subscribes to a lot of it. He is easily the dean of decolonial scholars in African studies. <laughs> Prolific, the titles of his books proclaim his positions. Let me give you two examples. Coloniality of power in postcolonial Africa, the myth of decolonization. I think that's a 2013 book. He's written so many. But another latest one, probably his latest, is called Epistemic Freedom in Africa, yeah. the Provincialization and Decolonization. A few of the claims, I mean, he's a decolonial scholar, and many of you are familiar with what the decolonials are saying. Some of them have said, <laughs> because I share some of those. So, Lobo Gacheni, I want to say, makes the claim that col colonialism did not end at independence. He also says decolonization is a myth, meaning post-independence decolonization is a myth. That's why he has that in his title. And another great claim that he makes is white supremacy in knowledge production is blocking African thought. And then he also believes, like many decolonials, that coloniality is what remains after colonization. Okay? Less than putting words in his mouth, <laughs> let me give you a couple of his quotes. He said, one of the strategies that have sustained the hegemony of the Euro-American constructed world order is its ability to make African intellectuals and academics socially located in Africa and on the oppressed side to think and speak epistemologically and linguistically like the Euro-American intellectuals and academics on the dominant side. This trap has made it very difficult for African intellectuals and academics to sustain a robust and critical perspective of Euro-American hegemonic knowledge and the asymmetrical power relations it enables." End of quote. From the more recent book, in fact, from the introduction, he says, and I quote, epistemic freedom in Africa the provincialization and decolonization is a study of the politics of knowledge in general, and specifically of African struggles for epistemic freedom. As a result of the long-term consequences of modernity, enslavement, and colonialism, African people have been reproduced as agents in Eurocentric history. I'll leave that alone. There are many more quotes. So, that's the position of the decolonial scholar, Tabelo Ndlovu Gatsheni. His work continuously in, in Dax Europe. Europe is never far out of his mind. Coloni decolonization and colonization are not far from his vocabulary. He calls them out. He highlights their ignoble role in short, short 
decolonization, colonization is never far from his thought. So let us now go to the anti decolonization scholar. Philosopher, Nigerian philosopher, Olufemi Taiwo wrote a book, and the title is Against Decolonization, Taking African Agency Seriously. And he comes out swinging at the colonial scholars. Despite the title, I am happy to say <laughs> He's not against decolonization per se. A Nigerian, he's not against or unhappy about the fact of Nigeria gaining independence from Britain in 1960. I'm happy about that, right? <laughs> yes. However, he divides decolonization into two. So when you read his book, it's a decolonization one with a small one and decolonization too, with the small two, okay? So this is what he says. He's not against independence. He's happy to, to be independent, to be independent. Rather, rather what he's against, and in his own words is this, and I quote, that the options of former co colonies are still limited by colonialism is what decolonization too sets up as the main element of its discourse. And it is what I attack because it misunderstands the problem to be solved. And it is generating confusion. As far as he's concerned, modernity was not a product of colonialism. If you've read any of the decolonial scholars, when we put modernity, you slash colonial, right? <laughs> they are twins. They, it's two sides of the same color. But Femi Taiwo doesn't buy that. He doesn't believe that colonialism has, has survived independence. He feels that colonization ended in Nigeria in 1960. He also opposes the racialization of discourse, which he thinks is what the colonials are doing. He says they see modernity as a Western inheritance, reason as European. This, these are some of the things. And then that colonization is not the only explanatory model for things that happened in the colonial period or post-colonial. He talks about choice, that Africans made certain choices. He talks about inertia. And his, his subtitle is Taking African Agency Serious. said, preoccupation with colonization does not leave room for critiquing our own pathologies, such as gender oppression, child marriage, chieftaincy, and a whole lot of things. Let me explicate Taiwo a little further. Says colonization ended at independence. Therefore, he does not understand how anyone could be decolonizing anything post-independence. Political independence gave us sovereignty. Thus, any preoccupation with decolonizing afterwards takes agency away from Africans. Hence the subtitle of his book, Taking African Agency Seriously. He also said colonial, colonialism has not survived independence. In contrast to the colonial scholars who say Coloniality is what survives colonialism. So you can see the contrast. And then, of course, remember Kwame Nkrumah, former president of Ghana, intellectual, who coined the term neo-colonial, said, seek ye first the political kingdom, and all other things will be yours underscoring the importance of independence. Olupemi Taiwo has no patience with the likes of Ndlovu Gacheni, who wrote about the myth of decolonizing, or even Ngugi Wationko, who wrote eloquently about decolonizing the mind. He is extremely critical of the amorphousness 
and lack of specificity in what people want to decolonize. It seems as if they want to decolonize, to, to decolonize anything and everything. And that just reminds me of the, the uh, award-winning Oscar film. <laughs> everything and anything at all times. People are decolonizing. <laughs> it's as if we wake up in our bed and say, yeah, I have to decolonize my breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> OK? Oh. And then his question is, what would decolonization look like when it is accomplished? Okay, but his biggest thing is that we should take African agencies seriously. If we're having load shedding, I leave that sentence hanging. <laughs> <laughs> but if Femi Taiwo were here, he'll complete that sentence. <laughs> I do leave it hanging. Okay, so. In the final section, in the final section, in the final section, let me talk about my work <laughs> and how it intersects with some of these debates, controversies, claims. In my book, The Invention of Women, with which some of you are familiar, I pointed out that gender in the first instance is a system of classification and therefore a mode in which knowledge is constituted and codified. Thus, the focus on gender categories in my work is also about the construction of knowledge. The global context for research and the production of academic knowledge is one in which concepts, theories, and concerns are determined by U European and American experiences. Consequently, the unequal power dynamics between Africa as one region of the world and Europe and America as another is a huge factor that must be considered when conducting research and producing knowledge. Since Western categories and concepts are not necessarily transcultural or universal, it became clear to me that a study of the gender concept must engage with deeper epistemological issues about identities of scholars and the historical and social context in which knowledge is being constituted. The book Invention traces the emergence of gender categorization in Yoruba society of Southwestern Nigeria to European imperialism of the body, mind, and knowledge, drawing evidence from family organization, language, division of labor, religion, oral traditions, I show that unlike in the West, gender was not originally part of the Yoruba conceptual framework for making sense of the social world. British colonization was both a racial and gendered process, and it was instrumental, I argue, in the establishment of the existing gender system in this region. In 1987, when I started my research, and this is an aside, I did not know that gender is a colonial category. <laughs> I should not surprise anyone, but sometimes it seems as if people just look at me that I woke up one morning and I, and I just wanted to quarrel. That's why I said, oh, gender is a colonial category. It was as a result of my research that I said, oh my gosh, it was a finding. Okay. And some of the evidence I brought to bear, the Yoruba kinship, kinship categories are not gender specific. Hence, there's no single word for son. There's no single word for boy, girl, daughter. There are no gendered pronouns and there are no gendered names. Although today we have gendered names increasingly. We can talk about that. The categories, even the categories husband and wife are not gender specific. Or to put it in another way, they are inclusive, unlike English kinship categories. Brother is male exclusive, sister is female, um, uh, female exclusive. Seniority, not gender, I found was the basis of Yoruba ordering of social relations. So our categories, Egmont, 
is not gender specific. Aburo is not gender specific. These are kinship categories. And the social ordering in our families was based on seniority, not gender. Thus, I concluded that gender as a mode of organizing society is simply not inherent in human nature. Although currently gender has become universal or universalized, I assert that the development must be understood in historical terms. The book Invention contributed to a paradigm shift in the understanding of gender as a social construct by insisting that our investigations should not take gender for granted in any locality, not even in Europe. You have to account for it. But must ask questions about how it is constituted, when, where, and how it came into being. The thesis put forth in my work denaturalized and deuniversalized gender, a construct that Euro Americans are able to impose around the world given their global power. I showed that the original Yoruba social organization was a seniority based system. In that society, the main principle of social relations was seniority defined by relative age. Let me ask about time so that I'll know what to include. Oh. It's fine. Okay. We don't have a concept of time. <laughs> <laughs> We're Africans. Ooh, nice. Okay. Furthermore, <laughs> My study exposed gender as a colonial category in Yoruba society. Apart from the parochialism of gender binaries like male, female, boy, girl, that European colonizers took for granted in their own society, I exposed the falsity of universalizing three Eurocentric assumptions about females, women, which had become pillars of feminist discourses. First, the idea that women are naturally excluded from the public sphere. I challenge that from my African, my Yoruba data. Second, that women by definition are minors. Someone is always in charge of them. They pass from father to husband and then to sons. And indeed, this is what Europeans instituted in settler colonies. And correct me if I'm right. <laughs> in settler colonies like Zimbabwe and South Africa, to devastating effects for women. If women are always minors, they can't open a bank account until some went to the extent that you have to bring your, son, your young son <laughs> so you could open an account. So they really practiced it. Um, third, I showed that given their biologic and a deep-seated ideology of biological determinism, Europeans understood social roles as being mapped on bodies. Thus, only those with the male anatomy have an inherent right and legitimate access to social power over other groups, especially women. So, as, uh, so only men are seen to produce, to be thinkers and who can produce knowledge. My work in invention challenged the unwarranted universalization of these ideas, showing that none of these assumptions were true of Yoruba society until Western colonization imposed its male dominant epistemology on the society. I showed that gender is not ontological to the Yoruba ethos. And thus, the presence of identifiable gender constructs in the language, in history, and social institutions today are evidence of recent social change. Succinctly stated, my thesis is that the presumption of gender and concomitant male dominance in understanding endogenous Yoruba institutions, social practices, and values represents an epistemological shift. And over time, possible epistemicide of its <coughs> cultural ethos. My 
other book that deals with this, I'll just summarize quickly and just make one major point. The great South African intellectual and anti-apartheid activist, Archie Mafeje, and I always want to claim I did meet at Archie Mafeje. <laughs> <laughs> Those are ancient. I'm happy to claim that I met him. I'm not making this up, no fake news. <laughs> <laughs> I did meet him. Asked, and I quote, what forms of accumulated knowledge do Africans have and how do we get at it? Mm. This question a or a variation of it has always informed my research an aspect of which is centered on the issues of coloniality and construction of knowledge. I believe that has been the running theme of my work. I also think that I like to think, and correct me if I'm maybe exaggerating, I always also see that that question that Ashima Feje asks, I also see it as a radical question. And I see it as a radical question in the context of the ways in which I have seen Africans of various ilks, including intellectuals. We, we, we behave as if Africans don't have knowledge, accumulated knowledge. So for him to just ask that question, he takes it for granted. We must take it for granted that Africans have accumulated knowledge. Mm. And we continue to. And maybe how do we do it more intentionally? It should be to question rather than everything we go elsewhere. We go elsewhere, right? So I like that question. So in my book, What Gender is Motherhood? I look at Ifa, which is a system of knowledge in Yoruba. But the most important thing, I'm not going to read this, that is critical to our discussion here, is that in the invention of women, I talk a lot, I write a lot about colonization and colonial imposition and all that. But when it comes to what gender is motherhood, I still see colonial in imposition and all. But what I, I realize, and it, I think it's important, is that I also question local scholars, African scholars. What has been our role? We're just sitting around and being imposed upon when we have some of the most brilliant scholars. So that in what gender is motherhood, I'm looking at the way in which if a, a system of knowledge has been masculinized, mm -hmm. how divine priests have been reduced to just men. Mm -hmm. I like reduced. <laughs> Not, oh, yeah. <laughs> just men. That women were not diviner priests and all that and all that, right? So one of the things that stands out in, in, in the book, What Gender is Motherhood, is the role of intellectuals and our local intellectuals. So when we are decolonizing, where do we put them? Let me end with a few a few quotes that that came to me and um essentially after I, I i wrote a paper on 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 patriarchalization of yoruba culture and all that and i wasn't talking of the british i was talking of yoruba people yoruba men <laughs> right and i remember i ended that paper with a quote from Mahmoud Mamdani. So let me read that, and then there's another quote, and then I'll stop. I said the multifaceted ways in which European colonization affected different groups of Africans has been well documented. The uneven effects of colonial policies across the states carved out by the European exploiters are well known. Mahmoud Mamdani writes eloquently about the multi-layered nature of the colonial state, which meant that the task of decolonizing for Africans at the moment of independence had to be equally complex 
if it were to be effective. Mamdani writes, and I quote, the core agenda that African states faced at independence was threefold, the racializing society, detribalizing the native authority, and developing the economy in the context of unequal international relations, end of quote. And I went on to say I could not agree more with Mamdani. However, he makes a huge omission in regard to the fact that the colonial state was also a male dominant state. Colonial racism and colonial sexism were intertwined in complex ways. The European colonizer not only had favorite races and favorite tribes, they also had a favorite gender. In the same way that colonial capital, material and cultural, was generated for whiteness across Africa. Similarly, it was accumul accumulated for the male gender. In effect, at the moment of independence, Africans had an additional task of transforming structures of male privilege and female exclusion that had been laid down. Besides, if democratic transformation is to be total and inclusive of all citizens, if women are, are not to remain just subjects and subjected, gender factors must be taken into account. Of all these things that Africans needed to do at the point of independence, I don't know how many we have accomplished in the decolonization process. That's one thing. Then I Um, the, I guess it's Motswana, <laughs> maybe I get it wrong, Motswana scholar of indigenous methodologies, Bagele Chilisa, defined decolonization in this way. Decolonization is a process of conducting research in such a way that the world views of those who have suffered a long history of oppression and marginalization are given space to communicate from their frames of reference. It is a process that involves researching back to question how the disciplines, psychology, education, history, anthropology, or science, through an ideology of othering, have described and theorized the colonized other and refused to let the colonized other name and know their frame of reference, end of quote. So I can live with this definition of decolonization. And I think what I do in invention is really to let the non-European epistemology come forth and all that. However, she said something here that is very similar to what Ilovu Gacheni has said. She said that the ideology of othering coming out of Europe, which has described and theorized the, the colonized as other and refused to let the colonized other name their frame of reference. And even in in, in, in the work of decolonial, Sabelos included, there are quotes like, they don't allow Africans to think, and things like that. So the question is, <clears throat> why do they have such power? How are they not allowing us to think? I think <laughs> that's the biggest issue that the biggest beef that Olufemi Taiwo has is that you guys have given up your agency. <laughs> Especially if we're not taking our leaders to task. After all, we voted for them. I think these are important questions that we must bear in mind. And so when I was preparing for this lecture, 
Because indeed, for me also, decolonizing, that word has become problematic. As I said, if what Buckingham Palace do is decolonizing, <laughs> uh, by, by, by uh, not, not bringing the diamonds they got from India to the coronation, right? Is that their decolonizing? They should just return it. Even Buckingham Palace itself, right? Anyway, if everybody is decolonizing, I mean, you, you, you even look at European conferences, they are decolonizing. What then is the meaning of, of decolonize? What sort of analytic category is it at this point? So I, I, I share those misgivings. And I also feel that we need to be more specific to decolonize something. With decolonizing society, with decolonizing thinking. When do we know that we've finished decolonizing things? <laughs> yeah. So one of the things I sought to do as, as I concluded this, I said, okay, what are some of the synonyms for decolonize? Because it seems to me that every time we use colonize, decolonize, mm -hmm. is that we are attributing power mm -hmm. to the colonial, to the colonizer. Mm -hmm. Right? And I'm Yoruba. The concept of Ashe, power of the word. So are there other ways we can talk besides talk, <laughs> practice, and put an end to some of these things? So I was looking for synonyms. <laughs> I said, so instead of saying that uh, decolonizing modernity, I'm sure somebody mm -hmm. You can say historicized. Instead of decolonizing gender, you could deconstruct. Can we decolonize Cecil Rhodes? Of course, we just remove him, erase, okay? I mean, there are, there are all sorts of synonyms. We can talk about indigenizing the discourse. We can talk about localized. We can talk about endogenized, we can talk about Africanized and restructure with specifics. Because it seems to me that every time we raise that question of, oh, decolonize is, is like this colonizer is still standing on our heads. And we should just push and, and, and push forward. Let me end with um, a nice little quote here that I like. And then that quote says, okay, the renowned Ghanaian linguist, Professor Kwesi Pra writes, intellectual sovereignty means a free, liberated and self-determining agency in knowledge production, which answers firstly to societal particularities while contributing secondarily and inadvertently to universal knowledge, end of quote. To decolonize knowledge is to endogenize, to indigenize, and to unlearn modes of submission in all its layers, to put ourselves at the center of daily life and our productions. Ultimately, from my point of view, the goal of transforming, instead of, I didn't want to say decolonizing, <laughs> is to reclaim, is not only to reclaim our sovereignty. It seems as if we haven't reclaimed our sovereignty. We need to. But most importantly, it is to reclaim our habits of sovereignty. Remember, we are sovereign now. Make it a habit. When there's a problem, yeah, these people want to do us in, but we'll show them Pepe, right? <laughs> Let me end there. Thank you. Oh, we just decolonized us. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I can see. Okay.
May we please give Pop a round of applause? Asheo. I myself, I'm truly decolonized. I'm reclaiming being a South Nigerian. So, <laughs> for those who don't know, South African Nigerian citizens, that's what it is. Um, you know, Prof, you really challenged us. I don't know. Can we please give another round of applause? Yeah. I wish, I wish, and I'm making my submission. Uh, I wish this can be a series because when Prof was talking about gender in her case studies, how she was, um, you know, utilizing the Yoruba culture. I remember that decolonization also means power. So your, uh, so your power is your radical self. So Prof Zondi, forgive me and Dr. Ojo, but I'm making a submission for such uh, that we have more series on the discussions that we're taking today. Um, Prof has challenged us with, for me, it's close to six questions. So, um, but we're getting into the exciting part, right? Which is, um, let us interact. You don't have to stand up from your seat. There are mics um, in each section. If you have a question, uh, we'll take five for the first round. And um, I don't want to waste time because I also have a few questions, but let's just give our guests an opportunity. Yes, Prof. Oh, you're the first one. Oh, no, no. <laughs> it's a gender thing. I'm just raising a hand to ask a question. Yes, <laughs> and on, in, on International Women's Day, they said we should embrace equity. So today, we're going to start. <laughs> yes. So also, uh, for our online audience, we'll also be taking um, note of your questions. Um, Bella, I think, will be assisting us in terms of reading out those questions. But let's first start with our guest in the venue. Is there any question? No okay. Oh, yes, it's right there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so let me start on my right, and then we'll proceed to the left. Um, yes, Bella? Oh, you also have a question? Yes. Yeah. Okay, wait. First, let me note, and then I'll start from the right, my right, and then we'll go to the left-hand side. Okay. One, wait, one, two, four, three, Bella, four, UJFM, five, for now, right? And then we'll come back to six, seven. But let us, in that order, is that fair? And the woman, you are safe. This is a safe space. So if you have questions, please, we have warriors here. This is the Africa we want. <laughs> okay, so we'll start with the beautiful lady. Um, yeah, <laughs> every day is Women's Day, so you may proceed. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. No, it's fine. We will hear you. No, no, it's fine. Don't do it. I told you we have warriors in this room. You can come closer. That's true. Yeah. You can stand up if you want. Any? No, I'm okay. okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, no, I really have, I think, a basic question. Um, well, I think it's basic. Uh, so, Fanon talks a lot about how um, a settler and um, the colonized men are waging a, a war over the domestic space. And I just wanted to know what you think about that. Um, also, <laughs> who who talks about that? Oh, okay. May you please project, please? Just you can read okay. ask the question okay. again. Yes, I I I heard you. Oh, okay, and also his critique of Senghor, um, Penance's critique of Senghor, um, in in when he starts writing on Rego Shu, Penance states that um the colonized individual will never live in a present or future that hasn't been touched by colonization, so. Do you think that that's something that um, we have to embrace in anti-colonialism, or it's something that we can do away with? Okay. Um, let's just take all the questions and then you answer. Paul. Okay. Number two. Who was number two? Uh, yeah, it was me. Okay. <laughs> um, 
uh, uh, can I um, pass my chance to my first year student uh, who needs to ask a question? Okay. And she'll get a mark for a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so my question is just how do we, or how do you recommend that we, like, us as Africans, we more intentionally, like, promote African education? Because it's like, like some of us, like myself, you know, I want to go back home to Nigeria and to be able to like improve the economy or to be able to improve like the situation and stuff. But a lot of people like aspire to leave the country and get an outside education. Like if someone's like, I will, like most people want to go abroad and get this American education or European education. And it's like, how do we promote African education and want to stay at home and have that Af and because I feel like a lot of the time we look down on African education and it's just like, how do you suggest or do you have any tips on how we as Africans just decide that we're enough? And instead of always looking abroad, like how do you just feel like you're enough? Because it's just, I think it's just so deeply rooted in the education that we see the West as being more superior. So how do we finally realize that? Africans are enough. So it's just. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, don't clap now. <laughs> okay. Uh, then, uh, Prop, are you next or should we ask Bella? Should we proceed to Bella, Prop? I'm, I'm done. Uh, okay, okay. She <laughs> cheated on my behalf. <laughs> okay. Bella, then, um, I think. Then the gentleman, yes, okay. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, Prof, hello, thank you so much for your lovely lecture. I just wanted to speak quickly about the reference you make in regards to the book um, Against Decolonization. Mm -hmm. So I think what we can take from that is that as Africans, we need to make active criticism mm -hmm. towards particular groups within Africa themselves that participated in the state that Africa looks like right now, criticize elite groups, criticize men, for example, in society, and what role they've participated in making society what it is now. And I would like you specifically to maybe answer what role you think Africans played in distorting what we understand as gender today. Mm. So particularly, I, I, I don't want to use South Africa, but I think it's an example that can be applied across the world. Traditional leaders are gatekeepers of what gender is and how gender is used specifically in society, which is very interesting if we're saying the old Africa, or at least Africa before colonization, is one that did not have these binary ways of looking at gender. So from you, Prof, I just want to hear what is our what what is the criticism towards African individuals and our role in playing in solidifying <laughs> binariness in um, gender? And what can we do to maybe dismantle that, particularly if African traditional leaders are gatekeeping that as their own, as part of African traditions in of itself? Thank you. Awesome. And then before I go to UJFM Prof, there's a question online. Have democracy and religion helped Africa? And that is from Maseko Ndumaku Zulu. Yes. Okay, over to you, JFM. Um, that's uh, um, actually a great question because I want to add to that. So, yeah. Um, in from the book Against Decolonization, I, I guess you have to concede that um, we are ascribing a little bit too much power mm -hmm. to this force that we're calling colonialism. Um, but at the same time, I do think there, there is still a degree of power that's actually there. And for example, um, like this person are saying religion, right? Yeah. Um, uh, colonial religions still play a massive part in, in Africa. So uh, my question is, do you lament um, Africans' commitments to colonial religions? Um, and then also, what do you think is the role of, of religion in epistemicide and of African knowledge and creating gender conceptions? Okay. So let us uh, uh, end the first session for now so that Prof can answer the, the six questions noted. Oh, Over to you. I can always decolonize by not answering. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda. You can come to the mic. Because the videographer wants to uh -huh. make sure that she captures everything. Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. 
The first question about Fano is so specific. <laughs> and since I, I, I don't remember having read Fanon recently, <laughs> I'm not able to answer his critique of Leopold Sedasenko. However, however, um, in reading against decolonization, and of course, um, many uh, decolonial intellectuals are fanonists. And you remember the concept of colonization being Manishian, binary, dividing people into two zones, zone of being and zone of non-being. And that's a Pannonian concept. And so, um, Olufemi Taiwo argues that many decolonial scholars misuse Fanon. So that, yes, indeed, colonization puts the colonized in the zone of non-being, makes them non-human. And Femi Taiwo says that at the moment of independence, we removed ourselves from the zone of non-being. So why do we behave as if we remain there? That's my response to the first question. Then the second question, how do we remove, uh, how do we improve our education? Why are we not enough and all that? You know what is interesting about such questions is that if, you, if one lives long enough, <laughs> you, you'll be able to even point to specific examples that the present generation is not even aware of. When I was at the University of Ibadan, at that time, our educational system in Nigeria had this thing called A-levels, right? They still have it in England, advanced level. I did A-levels. I always say that. We were the smart ones. <laughs> but after us, people could enter the university without A-levels. So if you, if, if, if you enter the university with uh, advanced level courses, you spend three years. If you entered just after your high school, you spent four years also. I remember that at that time, some children of privileged Nigerians would go to England to do A-levels. And then they would come back to Nigeria to go to university. Because at that time, the attitude was that <laughs> the, the, the university in edu education in Nigeria was superior because they, they had admissions to universities in England. For me, this was in the 70s. I went to, to, to school or to, to university in Nigeria in the late 70s. So at that time, that was our understanding. That's one example. A second example which um, Olufemi Taiwo writes eloquently about. At the moment, let's call it a post-colonial moment. After Nigeria, many African countries got their independence in the 1960s. There was a restructuring in some of our universities, right? Mm -hmm. That was how people introduced African history. Mm -hmm. And one of the hottest journals to publish in was the Journal of Historical Society of Nigeria. If you go look at the old edition, you see people struggling from, from European countries to publish in those journals. I am giving those examples that there was a moment where some of the, the things we see now were not like that. And for somebody like me, precisely because we witnessed those things, we know that those things were not impossible. I remember in Nigeria, growing up in Nigeria, people were, were, were producing pharmaceutical drugs. 
you have people producing all sorts of technical, technological things. But if you say that today, people will just laugh at you that you are making it up. But that was the Nigeria of a particular time before things totally changed. There was a period when we held our things and people were actively thinking of how to transform. No matter how short that period was, such a moment existed. So maybe we need to study those moments much more and see what changed. But I'm also conversant with the fact that our studies cannot be endogenous alone, because some of what has also happened is what has changed in the global system. So that indeed, I recognize that apart from talking about uh, colonization, impact of colonization, today we have to talk about globalization. Let me give you an example. And people laugh at some of us Nigerians, but it's not only Nigerians. When Chimamanda Adichie said, and some of us other Nigerians have said that, until I went to the US, I didn't know I was black. People think that we are cuckoo in the head, or that these Nigerians are not smart. And I remember Panache Chikumatsi said, I'm not going to talk to Nigerians about race. But well, that was how I felt too. You never thought you were black or anything. Somebody had black me since when? <laughs> okay. But we cannot say the same of the generation that is growing up. Even though they were born in post-independence Nigeria. The reason I say that is that globalization is in your face from your television. You will know that you're not black because your hair is not silky like the one on that sitcom, right? You are not like Kardashian. You don't have to leave your village. We have to take that too into account in how we respond. And I had given that kind of thing some thought because of the ways in which African women have responded to racism, colorism, in talk of beauty, right? <clears throat> they go to India to buy Indian hair, to buy Brazilian hair. I said, what is Brazilian hair? Have you ever been to Brazil? <laughs> <laughs> OK. So a whole lot of that. Also, there's a lot to say about globalization <laughs> as being imbricated with colonialism. And if I am going to have a conversation with Olufemi Taiwo, I am going to have that, that one too with him. And um, what role do we play? What role does culture play as an explanatory variable? I'm glad somebody raised that because that was one of my <laughs> initial reactions to some of the claims that Olufemi Taiwo was making, that Africans are always blaming colonization and decolonization for everything. But I said, no, Africans are always also blaming our culture. For those of us who are gender scholars who do that, that is one of the biggest things we have to struggle about. Oh, our culture says a woman should be under the table. <laughs> our culture says she must never eat. And they will say those things and they're happy with it. And that's the same thing with religion. The way they read their Bible, the way they read their, their, their Quran, the way they read. So religion and its interpretations are a big deal. But one of the things... Let me, that I want to leave with you, because those are big questions I cannot answer. Instead of us, whether it was the so-called chiefs, whoever they are, or the elders or whatever, I think 
the question we should pose universally in our societies and cultures is this. What sort of society do we want and how do we get there? Period. If we start thinking with that, then we don't have to, to start arguing. Oh, I have to have two wives. One has to have hair like this and hair. You, you get what I mean? What sort as a society, if we coalesce around such a question, where does it lead us? And then finally, and I have to be reading more on this, I had a wonderful, wonderful conversation with an Eritrean on Sunday. You never hear of Eritrea unless they want to say bad things about Eritrea. But I'm now going to study Eritrea. But one of the first things after Eritrea liberated itself, I'm not a politician, is that they deaccredited the universities. They took away the accreditation. <laughs> and then that when you ask about it, you say, we have only been producing scholars mm -hmm. that will go to America mm -hmm. to service, and we're not interested in that. We want to produce people for our own. That is the issue there. That is the issue. And Eritrea has suffered for it, right? But they stuck to their guns. But part of the reason why they have suffered for it is because they are isolated. They are the only ones doing what we all should do. Imagine if the whole continent operated in that way. And rather than even looking inwards, as a continent, we'll be circulating intellectuals, right? If we work together. So I do not see how individuals or even individual countries can solve this, these humongous problems that we see. Mm. It has to be a continental thing. We have to make AU work in multiplicity of ways. Let me stop there. Well, I think due to time, we'll only take one question. Uh, we'll only take one question from online and also on my left hand side. We humbly apologize because we're also cautious of some logistical issues for prof. But I think just two questions and then, oh, you have one. <laughs> That's why I said a series. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll, Bella, you'll signal us if there's any question online um, because we can see also our audience want to participate. But in the meantime, so I'll take uh, colleagues, only three from the venue, one online. Is that fair, Prof? Yeah, yeah. majority women. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then again, sorry. Okay, online two. Venue three, and just straight to the point. Yes. Two two minutes Thank you. <laughs> for your question. Okay, so um, it was one gentleman, prof, and then uh, ish. Kind of they said woman. Oh, <laughs> woman. <laughs> okay, one two. It's fine. So one, two is just a joke. <laughs> well, okay, so, and then the two of you, is that fine? And then online, Bella, you also help us. So it's the gentleman at the back, then it's Prof, and then it's two of our scholars. Yes. Okay, we'll start with you, sir. Just be audible and, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, um, Prof, for your, for your talk. Um, my question goes down to the whole notion of um, the problem that um, Taiwo has with the whole notion of decolonization and then um, especially the later philosopher, the later Matulino, 
who says that we should not worry about epistemic decolonization and all of that. We should think about politics and um, the social affairs of Africa. And I can get a bit of that also from your presentation as well. But do you think that um, if we, don't you think that epistemology has a role to play with our identity? When we have identity conflict, can we think about politics? Can we think about the, the social welfare of a society when we have identity conflicts? And don't you think that epistemology, we going back, especially you talking about the whole notion of gender from the Yoruba culture, we going back to that notion and trying to reinvent that epistemology, don't you think that it will help shape our identity? And also this whole notion of um, um, taking, removing decolonization and maybe using the word reinventing and all of that. Don't you think that is a little bit uh, more of a cosmetic um, form of um, um, decolonization? Don't you think the concept, we should focus more on the concept of decolonization regardless of which terminology we want to stress? Okay, and then Prof? Okay, I'll probably, I'm glad I'm close to you, so I can whisper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll probably noted that uh, Professor Tiet Adai um, looked at colonization uh, as an episode. Um, I was wondering if you could engage this further. And um, how do you reconcile this with the fact that Tiet yeah, Adai, alongside um, scholars like Kenneth D.K. Mm -hmm. were the champions of Ibadan School of History, a decolonial school of thought that um, you know, challenged the uh, sentiment and Western, uh, instruments of Western thought. Okay, and then just the two, yes. Hi, am I audible? Yes. 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 <laughs> um, the question that I have is in deconstructing gender, especially within Africa, do you think it's important to include people that do not identify within gender, people like non-binary people and gender diverse people? That's my question. Okay. And then over to you, Madam. Um, so my question is a bit related, but um, I'm thinking in terms of sort of the epistemological framework in which we're operating. Mm -hmm. If we're, I mean, I love your work. Uh, I, I think we need more work around deconstructing maybe the Western conceptualization of gender. Mm -hmm. But how do we, um, we are so constrained by the, language that we have inherited as well. I mean, we're speaking English. It is the common, uh, either it will be French or whatever, and all these European languages are very gendered. Everything is gendered. Mm -hmm. So it becomes quite difficult to even think past gender if you are so uh, embedded in its logic. It's the same as any kind of other thinking that we're limited by, whether we're thinking in terms of economics or whatever. But if we're thinking in this very um, contained systems that are really difficult, limit our creativity. How do we move past that as Africans? Okay, thank um, you. There are two questions yeah. online, um, Jalifa and Sharif. If you could please, Trey, if you could please unmute and speak. Okay, sh yeah. Shall I go first? Yes. I go first? yes. 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 Hi, hi uh, everyone. Um, I'm just having a big fangirl <laughs> moment. I'm so happy to hear everything that you shared. You were on fire and it was deeply inspiring because I've been going to so many talks now where de decolonizing or epistemicide is in the title and it's been so superficial and not meaningfully engaging with the the work and the concepts so thank you and i also teach your work as well and i used your work in my phd and i'm i'm going to stop and get to my question now um so when you said um that we as africans need to reclaim our habits of sovereignty um i work a lot with decolonizing the self and for me decolonizing the self and decolonizing should always be about the return of lands uh, to indigenous people and black people, right? Particularly in the context of South Africa. But for me, who's non-indigenous and through um, indenture came to be South African, um, it is a, is a return 
uh, it's returning to that relation to land, not in terms of territory, but in terms of our ontologies and our epistemology, epistemologies, because once we start to decolonize that, what we find is that our own ways of knowing and being are deeply tied to land and the sea and the sky and all of the natural environment. And I guess that my overall question I want to ask is, what do we do, because this was said to be a safe space, what do we do with the patriarchy within decolonial thinking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Zuleika, you're very safe. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and I think in conclusion, we'll hand over to Pell Mashabani online. Is Pell still available? Maybe there's low shading. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then we have Mojale Fa Mangero. You can unmute, sir. MJ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, th thank you, Prof, for for the wonderful presentation. I just wanted to point out to one thing. When you mentioned that um, that probably maybe the issue that we have with the decolonization now it could be around um, the issue of labels, and then you went on to say that maybe we should rethink the way in which we term uh, decolonization to moving to uh, what's this? Maybe localizing, Africanizing, and all of that. So I just wanted to ask that: won't that create an impression that decolonization is an event? While is if we have then realized post-colonial scholars, what have really showed us is that it's never an ending process because we are dealing with a very historical process of colonialism. And also, if decolonization ends, it didn't certainly end in a post-independence because if it did, we wouldn't be talking about decolonization today. So I just wanted to... to uh, hear your thoughts around that, that if we are moving away from, let's say, maybe decolonization as a label, then you're using it. Won't that then create an impression that decolonization is an event? And also, maybe the issue is not the decolonization in terms of a label. It could be that it's the doing of the actual decolonization to say that you don't actually have to say you are decolonizing something to decolonize. The mere fact that probably maybe you are teaching as uh, previously silenced knowledge and you are making, uh, I don't know, maybe an environment for African languages to then exist in the classroom, then that is on its own a way of decolonizing without really bringing the term decolonization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mujalifa. I think we'll stop um, with MJ. Uh, Okay, Moraina, it's like he was doing a, a you know, push up. <laughs> I was getting confused, like, okay, uh, I don't know, intellectual gymnastics, I don't know, but can we just give him a chance and then we. <laughs> Look, man, <laughs> you're ready. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I do want to, like, uh, make a comment about uh, anti decolonization. Uh, I also recently just uh, heard about uh, Professor Taiwo, who the speaker, someone I really admire so much. I knew her in 2020 and has uh, kind of uh, recalibrated my epistemic personally. But for me, I think to say that, for me, I do not find any problem with decolonizing everything and anything. In fact, I think it is right and it is the uh, I think it is what we need that we decolonize anything and everything. Because as Africans, I think we do not have control of our lives. So beyond the academy, to politics, to economics, I think everything needs to be decolonized. And for me, I do not find it wrong not to co-opt, like, not to co-opt other words like localizing, uh, indigenizing, and every other thing. But I think decolonization is the family of radical thought as put forward by, uh, by, by Professor Indilovu. So it doesn't reduce that we should use other terms, but to say that decolonize, decolonization or decoloniality has lost its relevance is to argue that, our, that coloniality 
is not the is not at the background or surface of of the challenges that we face as Africans, which I think it really is. And like the comments I put in the chat box, I asked, do we really have control of our lives? Which I think we do not. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Lukman. Okay, so top over to you. I, I have to say to the last person also that that's precisely the point. We need to take control of our lives. Or who do you think <laughs> will take control of your lives for you? We need to. Okay? And, and, and so... Um, uh, the first question was on epistemology instead of politics. I don't know that I gave the impression that politics supersedes epistemology. But you have to remember at this moment that we are talking, it's not as if, let's say, in 1945, 1950, in Nigeria or in Ghana, that some people were sitting around and say, oh, should we go first for the epistemology or the politics? No. The reason why the whole issue of politics comes first is because people had to rest their countries. And that's a thing. And it's real. And that, that, that independence has its own reality. It may not have been everything, but it's a fundamental base upon which you can build other things, including the epistemology. And when you go read the, 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 the story of Kwame Nkrumah, you see that's precisely what he did. Okay, so seek ye first the, the political kingdom. People say, oh, he was naive, he was what? The political kingdom had to be seized. And then, of course, they discovered that their economy wasn't in their hands. But it was the same Kwame Nkrumah that was so interesting about him. And we all have to study him further. Who started African studies talking about epistemology? He started African studies because he knew we had to study this stuff understand ourselves and create knowledge. So it's not either or. These things are entwined. But we have to realize and give credence to that moment of independence. It means something. We can't just dismiss it. That's what this is about, rather than uh, an either or situation. And then uh, Professor Adiyajai, Professor Adia Jai, um, Kenneth D.K., Saburi Biobaku, those were the historians who cre created the Ibadan School of History. So you couldn't dismiss Adia Jai and just put him with the, the white people who were saying, oh, it was episodic. But you also have to remember he's a historian. He's a historian. What do I mean by that? I think part of the argument, I haven't read it in a while, but part of the argument people like Adia Jai also made is that because we're so still so close to colonization, that's why it looms so large. What will you say to that? And when we talk about chronology and history, is 60 years so long? in relation to what? So you have to appreciate his context. And yes, he didn't say it's episodic and they were working. They made oral tradition a legitimate source of history, not just for Africans. In historical discourse worldwide, they weren't just sitting and saying it's episodic. But then you have to consider, as I said, the context historical context, especially since humanity started on this continent. 
those are the things we, we must think about. And I remember yesterday I was reading um, 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 Ali Mazui, another of the juggernauts. And Ali Mazui talks about different ways in which you can talk about Africa, right? To the extent that he was saying that uh, uh, the Middle East originally was not separate from Africa and all that. So he, he used different tropes to talk. I mean, the triple heritage, right? The indigenous, the, um, I forget the two others, but I've always, from the inception, when I first saw the triple heritage, when it was first created, my big critique of Ali Mazri was that, how could he put the indigenous, Islam, and Christianity as if the three are, are equal? Oh, I always found that problematic. But the other day, thing I noticed the other day about what I found problematic about some of the, I mean, he has some wonderful ideas. I love his work, especially his use of language. It's fantabulous. But when he talks about Africa, I don't see him making any hay. <laughs> I don't see him making a big deal of the fact that humanity came out of Africa. That for me is a big deal. And you know what I called it immediately? I said, that is matricide. Yes. What, what, what have we made of that as a people? Um, 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 um. We have to create counter elites. <laughs> if some of these elites are not working for us, <laughs> You know? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> then the whole issue of language. Language is always a big deal, right? And of course, you can see how important language was or is in my work. If I didn't speak Yoruba, I couldn't have written invention. But despite the fact that I spoke Yoruba, talking about how our thinking is occluded, right? When I went to do field work, so-called field work in Nigeria, I sat at the Institute of African Studies in, in Ibadan in 1987. Okay, at that time, I knew about the non-genderness of Yoruba language, and that came to me, not in Yoruba land, by the way, is as a result of being away from it, and you said one day, we, we don't do that. Anyway, so I, I, I knew about the non-genderness of the language, but it was just by the way. I didn't see it as that consequential, even though in my graduate classes at the University of California, Berkeley, I always challenged them when they made all these universal claims. So I wake up, Institute of African Studies, I said, okay, I know that Yoruba society is different, but what I have to show is that, well, there are different forms of gender and they did their gender differently. That was what was going on in my head. So I, I sat down and wrote a questionnaire. I'm going to be interviewing traders, entrepreneurs in the market, the so-called market woman. I don't like that concept. I said, I'm going to inter interview them about their family life. So when you finish in the evening, who does the dishes? Is it your daughter or your son? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was going to do in order to be able to tease out gender discrimination or what, what, what. Anyway, and then of course, I didn't also want to, to, to put words in people's mouth and say, how many daughters do you have? How many sons or how many children? Of course, I had learned that. Oh, in Africa, we don't say that. You don't count people's children. Are you a witch? You want to eat them? Or they know what? So I was also thinking, oh, the, the ways in which I'm going to do this. And so I put this questionnaire together. How many do I, I didn't tell many daughters. Uh, the person who did this, so that I, I can tease out gender. Mm -hmm. Then I looked at the questionnaire. I see 
I had a research assistant. I said, oh my God, my questionnaire was in English. I'm Yoruba. I'm talking to Yoruba people. And not the ones at UJ <laughs> <laughs> or Harvard, right? <laughs> I'm talking uh, to regular people. <laughs> also, don't to take regular this people. <laughs> <laughs> and I had written my questionnaire <laughs> in English. <laughs> then it dawned on me. Mm. It dawned on me mm. that I had a problem. Mm. And that was the beginning of my epistemological shift. Mm. I didn't know it before then. Mm. Yeah. Okay? Uh, so, when we talk about language, <coughs> and Lugi is the chief language person and the limitations, we can go on and on and on about that. And I have quarreled with the people who look at language as a means of communication. They always look at it as just a means of communication. But I think the most critical aspect of it has to do with identity. Mm. Identity. So all those things are not in doubt. But in fact, I think that one of the most interesting chapters in Against the Colonization is his language chapter. Because Part of the question we must ask in places where we've had 60 years of this independence. And Olufe Mitai was Yoruba. So he uses Yoruba discourse, and I, I, I know that discourse. Yoruba language is one of the most developed on the continent. And this is relative because indeed we have people. And at the University of Ife, you can get a bachelor's. They've been getting it in Yoruba for a while. And there are people like Professor Bang Boshe who have tried to develop terminologies for science and whatever, but it hasn't gone any further. The question is why? The question is why? We must. <laughs> if we're going to do anything, it's a lot of work. Why are we not doing it? I was surprised in my same conversation with this person who is Ethiopian Eritrean. I've always wondered why the OAU didn't adopt Amharic for, for the continent. After all, we took, um, what was it, OAU? to Ethiopia. And I've never known this before. This person told me, he went to, to University of Addis Ababa. He said, I study civil engineering. But the development of our language stopped at high school level. I was surprised. I told them Harry had it all. That people hadn't developed the scientific language for you to use in civil engineering. So they did all their studies in Amharic, but when they got to the upper level, civil, they had to start resorting to English. Remember, Ethiopia was never colonized, but they had to be using English. All this to say, I recognize all those misgivings. One recognizes it. But we haven't been doing the work. And then in the absence of not doing that, <coughs> that work, is everything lost? After all, look at me. I came to an epistemological. <laughs> uh, I, I, my eyes opened. And I'm saying this, I'm laughing because years ago, my book is 26 years old. I remember somebody did a review of the book. It was favorable. But the person said, well, Professor, you so, will be so vociferous about colonization and people who have done this against Africa, whatever, how we can't think. But she's a good example. 
of the person who is able to think in spite of it. Taking our history seriously, we must adopt an attitude of in spite. In spite of it. Yes, build languages and stuff. But in Nigeria, they are not going to speak all those languages at once. You know? And then the question of transgender. The question of gender and trans is a big one today. Huge. Huge in the sense that in the West, I remember giving a speech in which I said, the Western gender system has failed, mm. right? The binary, because you have all these people now say, don't put me here, don't put me there. And now in the US, you can actually have a non-binary passport. I don't know how that helps you. I think it does, but people, people are still faced, right? And then I get quite a number of inquiries. Because there are a lot of, there are trans people and gay people who believe that the argument, my argument in invention, provides a certain opening about the society. And then when you see some Yoruba diaspora communities in places like Brazil, many people are gay, openly gay. And they talk about, <laughs> about uh, the culture and the language and, and, and trans this, trans that. So I have spent time reflecting on, especially some of the, the, the most controversial and, and, and aspects of this in the US. People talk about gender fluidity. And I think in, in if you are mad, you miss work. It's gender fluidity. But the, the, the society I describe in Invention of Women, I describe a non gender society. And so I find it difficult. In fact, when I was writing Invention, one of the most difficult concepts for me to deal with, I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't know didn't know how to put it together with the society, is the idea of gender identity. I kept thinking, from the perspective of Yoruba land, what's gender identity? Especially since today you wake up, your mother is your mother, then somebody comes from her family compound, they say, hey, my husband, please. <laughs> and then another person comes and say, hey, my wife, another person tried her. I said, okay, did people get confused? I, 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 could, I, I could never, I, so that for me is, is an issue. But what you see across this continent, and I think that the West, especially feminists, they need to acknowledge the work that Ifi Amadou made it, people like me did, because they are always talking of Judith Butler, right? But there are concrete cases, what I find so fascinating on this continent, and we need to study to see what we can borrow <laughs> in which to move ahead. You have woman to woman marriage. Women marrying women. Across so many African societies, it's a social institution. You have this, over 200 societies in Africa had woman to woman marriage. Yoruba society didn't have it. Across East Africa, you have some, some chieftaincies in which, if you are the chief, I don't like the term chief because it's a diminution of their position. In order to be able to rule, you have to put on the mask of a mother. You have so many things on this continent that may be an opportunity for, for us to learn. I feel that a lot of the issues that have developed in the West, and it doesn't stay in the West anymore, it's all about here, is a product of societies in which things have been so binarized and they have put people into boxes. And so how do we go forward? 
how do we how, how do we do anything about these things? But I think that what I always we must come back to is my admonition and question. What sort of society do we want? And how do we get there? And all these questions should be subsumed on it. Let me stop before, but I, I have an example of that. I remember a few years ago, I had entered a very hot <laughs> conversation. It was in somebody's living room, both male and female, Yoruba, highly educated people. And somebody was saying something, and then the men were not happy. <laughs> Some of them, their wives were there. I said, how can you say this? And I said, you know, a lot of what you are saying is gender discriminatory, and they want to jump up and down. And I posed the question. And that silenced them. Because I think these are reasonable people, supposedly reasonable people. I said, as an individual who wants a lot of things, you want your career to go well, you want your children to do this, you want your to marry, you want to be able to travel to London every summer, whatever you, you want to do. I said, is there any one of these things that you think a woman should not be able to do? And tell me why. If these are things that you desire and you're working towards, why should a woman not be able to do that too? That is the question. What sort of societies do we want to build for everybody? Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. That was amazing. This is what we call a knowledge cafe, and I'm sure it's not the last. Um, without wasting any time, colleagues, I'm just going to call our very own Dr. Akinola to give us a vote of thanks. Doctor, over to you. Are you clapping for me? <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> Ah, it feels good. Uh, I really need to ask us to do something, if you don't mind. Uh, can we stand up and clap for Professor oh, Yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. And it's, it's really stimulating engagement uh, with Professor Yehum. Yes, of course, I didn't expect less. Uh, but let me use this opportunity to appreciate everyone, everyone that has been part of this meeting, uh, our organizers, uh, the lead of the of the unit, Pan-African Women Unit, we want to appreciate you. Uh, Professor Zondi, my boss, I usually appreciate him uh, because I know if I don't do that, I might be in trouble. <laughs> uh, for our virtual participant, thank you. For the administrative unit, thank you. For our student assistant, thank you. For all of you, we appreciate you. But before you go, I think they provided some menu here. They call food. I hope it's a decolonized food. Uh, <laughs> Thank you and enjoy your food. Bye. <laughs>
I never knew that you were coming. I, I never knew that I was coming. Yo, yeah. no, it's a whole story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yo, you know, <laughs> let's go. 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 Let's